couple of days, we have had our vacation Bible school going on. And as I prayed about them and what they were doing, as I prayed about the uh, things that we were going through, I'm going to tell you, if you've never been a part of vacation Bible school, you are missing out. The only thing you're not missing out on is rest. Because let me tell you, it is hard to do vacation Bible school. It is a hard thing to give of your time, especially after you've worked all week, to be able to make time to make it happen. But we do it because it matters. As we say here at Riverside, the message matters too much. We are all about making messengers of God's grace, and the message matters too much for us to be apathetic. It matters too much for us to be lazy. It matters too much for us to let our preferences or our prejudices or our presupposed notions to get in our way. The message of the gospel matters too much. And with that in mind, all that in mind, today I want us to look at an incredible depiction where, where we see something that happened in the ministry of Jesus in Mark chapter 2. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. We're going to be at the very beginning of the verse. Excuse me. Got something on my lip there. Um, Mark chapter 2. Now here we are seeing kind of the beginning of Mark's uh, explanation of the ministry of Jesus. But as we get there, I want to tell you today, I'm going to ask you a question. But with this question, I'm going to invite you on a journey. Okay, this question leads to a greater journey. And the question is this. It's on the screen. Who's your one. Now, some of you, you've already heard this question before. You're like, Chris, we've talked about this question for years, but today I want to focus in in a new specialized way because we are going to come alongside of Southern Baptist churches all across the United States to join in in this effort with the North American Mission Board to find a person and share the gospel with them. Who's your one? Now, in our passage in Mark chapter 2 today, we are going to see some people who decide that they know who their one is and they're going to do whatever it takes to get that one to Jesus. If you're ready to get started, say, let's go. Here we go. Matthew, or excuse me, Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. When he entered Capernaum again after some days, it was reported that he, Jesus, was at home. So many people gathered together that there was no more room. It was so packed in, there was no room. There was no social distancing happening in this house, okay? It was packed in, and there wasn't even room in the doorway, and he was speaking the word to them, teaching God's word to them. Verse 3, so they came to him bringing a paralytic. Who is they? We don't really know. As a matter of fact, we're never going to find out through the rest of this story. But they came to him bringing a paralytic carried by four of them. And since they weren't able to bring him to Jesus because of the great crowd, they gave up and went home because they were frustrated. Is that what it says? They decided that they'd just sit around and wait and see what happened. No, that's not what it says. What does it say? It says, they removed the roof above him. And after digging through it, they lowered the mat on which the paralytic was lying. So they dig a hole in somebody's roof, break through the rafters, get a big enough hole so that they can lower a person on a mat through it. That's not a tiny hole. This isn't like a little water leak when it's rainy outside. They bust it. They, hey, buddy, you're going to have a sunroof soon because we're going ahead and making the hole. So they drop this guy. Well, they don't drop him. They lower him. Thankfully, they didn't drop him. Although I thought to myself, if they dropped him on his feet, do you think he'd feel it? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But they, they lower him down to Jesus' feet. And then look what happens. Verse 5. Seeing their faith. Whose faith? Their faith. Who's there? The same people that was the they. So this man who's being delivered and the faith of the people that were bringing him down, Jesus told the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, that's incredible. That's amazing. That's marvelous. But in case you didn't know it, they weren't bringing him to Jesus to get his sins forgiven. See, they looked at this guy and they thought his greatest need was that he was a paralytic. He was paralyzed. But Jesus saw beyond that. Jesus saw the deeper need. Verse 6, haters going to hate, 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 hate. But some 
of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does he speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And then right away, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were thinking like this within themselves and said to them, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Can I just bring you a very quick realization from this? Jesus knows what you are thinking in your heart right now. Right now, whether you're thinking, man, I wish I knew what I was having for lunch. I hope he gets done in time for us to beat everybody to the restaurant. Right now, when you're thinking, I can't believe she wore that. Right now, when you're thinking, whoo, that could turn the air up a little bit. Right now, when you're thinking all those things, Jesus knows what your heart is thinking. God knows exactly what you're thinking in this moment. That should both make us incredibly in awe of God for his omniscience, his power, his knowledge, but it should also scare us to death. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes I get distracted and start thinking about the wrong things. Or I start thinking wrong things about God. Jesus heard all of those thoughts. Verse 9. So... Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk? Which one would be easier? But so that you may know that the Son of Man, I have authority on earth to forgive sins, he looks at the paralytic and says, verse 11, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And immediately he, the paralytic man, got up. He took that mat that had been lowered down from the ceiling and he went out in front of everyone. Now this is interesting. They didn't have room to get him in, but all of a sudden he's got room to walk out. I imagine some people were moving out the way. Excuse me, sir, let me give you a path. Because something crazy just happened. They just saw all of these amazing things happen. As a result, they were astounded and gave glory to God saying, we have never seen anything like this. These people chose to do whatever it took to get this man to Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk about for just a moment. Pray with me. Lord, it is so easy for us to get focused on the wrong things, to get distracted, to give up, to move on. And God, thank you that these four people did not do that. They looked at their friend in his need and they said, whatever it takes, we will get him to Jesus so he can find healing. But they didn't even realize the real healing that he needed. God, may we learn from your word. May your spirit speak to us in the deepest parts of our souls. And give us wisdom through this time of discussing your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're asking this question, who's your one? These Four people, their one was the paralytic man. They said, whatever it takes, we're going to do what it takes to get people, to get this person to Jesus. The question today before us is, who's your one? I'm going to give you three steps, say three, to figure out who your one is. First, identify your one. Well, you're like, Chris, I don't know who my one is. Maybe so, but maybe right now in this room, right now, you are thinking to yourself, I know exactly who it is I need to get to Jesus. See, some of you, you've been praying for that person for years. You've been praying for a specific neighbor, friend, colleague, family member for years and years and years. And you have not seen it happen yet, but you also haven't had the boldness to go and share the gospel with them yet. And until you do that, you haven't done all you can do. And so you already know who your one is, but some of you, you need to identify your one. You need to figure out who's the one person that God wants me to reach out to. If I had to just pray for one person, we could pray for everybody. Dear Lord, let there be world peace because I want to win Miss America 2021, right? We could, we could just pray a broad prayer, but we need to pray specific focused prayers as well. And so who's the one? Identify your one. You're like, I don't know who my one is. Well, let me ask you this. Look around your circles. See, we all live in circles. We have different circles that converge around us, whether it's this is my school people. These are my schoolmates, or, or if you're a teacher, these are the people I work with. There's also the people we work with, the people we do hobbies with, like the people we fish with, or the people we bowl with, or the people we play ball with, whatever. What about the people, like we said, that we work with, your coworkers? What about your neighbors? Do you even know who they are? Can you name them? 
See, somewhere in the midst of these circles, including your family, is a person that you need to commit to say, whatever it takes, I, like these people who are willing to rip the roof off of a house, I am willing and ready to do what it takes to make sure this person hears the gospel so that their life can be changed by the message of God's grace. Chris, okay, I look in my circles, but I don't know what I'm looking for. Well, we'll look for needs. You know, these, these people didn't just pick any old person. They picked the paralyzed person for a reason. Because they saw a need. Now, when they got him to Jesus, Jesus saw a deeper need. And often what we find in our life is when people are in need, they're hurting, there are needs in their life, there is also a deeper need at play. You look at your friend and they're, they're depressed. Listen, your friends that are depressed, they don't just need a laugh. They need the joy that can only be found in Jesus. Your friends that are lonely, they don't just need a friend. Yes, they do need a friend, but they don't just need a friend. They need a relationship with God. They need a relationship with God our Father through Jesus Christ. Your friend that's wounded, they've had stuff go on in their life, they're hurt. They don't just need time to heal. They need the great healer to come and heal their heart so he can begin to heal their spirit. The prideful people in your circles, they don't just need to learn to see themselves right, they need to learn to see God right. Because then they will begin to see God right, themselves right. Your friends who are just confused, they, they, they've got all kinds of questions. They don't just need answers. They do need answers, but that's not all they need. What they need is to know the God of the universe and to trust in Jesus. You say, Chris, I'm still not sure. Thinking through my circles, I'm thinking through all the different needs, I'm still not sure. Well, well, let's do this right now. We're going to take 15 seconds right now. And we're going to do something that you can do to figure out who your one is. You ready? 15 seconds. That's how long it'll take you to do what you need to do. You ready? Pray and ask God who's your one. Let's do it right now. Lord, give us wisdom, each of us individually, to know who is our one, the one person that we need to invest everything into getting to Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. And my prayer is that God will show you through the, looking at your circles, looking at your needs, looking, through, looking to God in prayer, that he will show you who your one is. First, you have to identify your one. That's what they did. They identified their person, their paralyzed friend that needed to get to Jesus. Then secondly, you do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes. Now, I don't know if you think about this. I don't know if anybody's had any issues at their home recently. I've had, we've had some issues. We got back from camp and the air, uh, our air conditioner wasn't working. And that was hard when you had been camping in 90 plus degree weather. And then you come back and your house is 90 plus degrees. That was tough. But let me tell you something. Here's an issue I haven't had recently in my house. I haven't had any of my neighbors come and climb up on my roof and start peeling back the shingles and then start peeling back the wood, and then bust through the rafters, and then bust down through all of the sheetrock in the ceiling to make a big enough hole to lower someone through. That hasn't happened at my house recently. Anybody that happened to you? I know some of you might live in some flimsy apartments, and it might have happened by accident, but it wasn't on purpose, okay? These people brought their friend to Jesus, and they got there, and they looked and realized, We've carried him this far. How are we going to get him that far? And I imagine some people went to the door. Excuse me, can, can you guys make? No, there's no room. It's like Forrest Gump. No room here, right? Just can't get through. So what do they do? They take this guy and they go up on the roof. Now, to be fair, it was probably a little bit easier because most houses in this time frame would have had uh, like a rooftop garden area. So they would have had stairs to go up to the roof. Uh, which would have been a flat roof. So, so they probably took him upstairs. But still, listen, I barely walk stairs, period. Much less walk stairs carrying somebody. So they carry this guy up to the roof. They get him on the roof, and then they look and go, huh, thought there was a chimney or something. It's going to pull a Santa move. Nope, okay. No hole, we'll make one. Now notice it doesn't say they brought themselves up some tools, doesn't say that. So most likely, how do you think they got through the roof? The old-fashioned way. 
they took their hands and they started pulling and ripping on that clay and on that mud and on that wood. And they started pulling and jerking and kicking and beating. Can you imagine being in the room below? Jesus is teaching them about Noah. And they loaded the ark two by two. Rain fell that day, not dirt from the ceiling. You get, you, can you imagine? And over time, they finally break the rafters apart. They open up the roof, and they get a big enough hole. I mean, you got to imagine people are down there going, somebody just put a roof, in, a hole in this roof. And they're still going. They're still open. They did whatever it took to get their friends to Jesus. Notice I did not say to get their friends to church. you got to do whatever it takes to get your one to Jesus, not to get them to church. I'm not saying we don't want them to come to church. We want your one to come to church. Of course we do. But this is not about growing the numbers of Riverside Baptist Church. This is about getting people who desperately need the gospel to the only one who can give them life, Jesus. See, you can't give anyone life. Only Jesus can. You can't forgive anyone's sin, sins, only Jesus can. You can't heal anyone, only Jesus can. And so you do whatever it takes. I, anybody been watching the Olympics? Anybody been watching the Olympics? I've been watching the Olympics. I was amazed the other day when the Philippines had their very first gold medalist. She was a weightlifter. But what amazed me the most was during COVID, she could not go to a gym to work out. So she and her friends started meeting at her house, and what they did was they filled up these giant jugs with water, and they put them on a stick, and they would work out with this stick with the water just waving back and forth, keeping everything unbalanced to build their core strength. She could have just given up. I can't get to the gym, so I'll just give up on my diet. Does that sound like anybody in the room? I can't get to the gym, so I'll just give up on the Olympics. But no, she did whatever it took. So when you care deeply enough, you do whatever it takes. Can I be real honest with you just for a second about why most people give up? Because they're afraid. Most people don't share the gospel because they're afraid. They're afraid of rejection. What if this person rejects me because I'm coming to them with the gospel? They're afraid that they're going to mess up. They're, there's this fear of, of failure. What if I don't say the right things? What if somehow I mess it up? There's the fear of how are other people going to look at me? How are other people going to react to me? There's this fear of it's going to be really weird and awkward. Listen, if you care about someone, you have awkward conversations with them. If I was up here right now, and my zipper was down, I would hope someone would care enough to come have an awkward conversation with me. Because when you care, you're willing to do the hard things. If you love your one, you won't let fear stand in the way, just like these people didn't let the crowd stand in the way. Lastly, so first, you got to what? Identify your one. Secondly, do whatever it takes. Lastly, leave the rest up to Jesus. You need to understand this. You cannot save your one. Well, Chris, you don't know how good I am at arguments. You don't understand how persuasive I can be. If you can persuade them into heaven, somebody else will persuade them out. You cannot save your one. You cannot forgive their sins. You cannot heal them. What you can do is share the gospel and get them to the only one who can. So our job, our only job, is to do whatever it takes to love people and get them to the gospel, get them to Jesus, and then let Jesus do the rest. Jesus did the healing of this man. Jesus did the forgiving of the sins. And we have to know that our only part in this is to get people to Jesus. And then Jesus does the rest. I want to ask you, these four men brought the paralytic to Jesus because they believed Jesus could heal him. I just want to ask you, do you believe Jesus can save your one? Do you believe that if they repent and believe in Jesus, God will save them? If you don't, you don't believe in Scripture that says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. 
that anyone who confesses the Lord will become his child. But the bigger thing is sometimes we get so focused on our inabilities, we forget that it's God's abilities that make everything happen. Do you believe he can heal your one? Do you believe he can change your one? Do you believe he loves your one? You need to identify your one. Do whatever it takes to get them to Jesus. Hard conversations. Buy them a meal. Invest in them. Spend time with them. I know it's hard. We all have limited resources. But do whatever you can to get that one to Jesus. I want to close by saying this today. There are two people in this room today. There are two types of people in this room today. Number one, there are people that you're here, but your faith isn't in Jesus for salvation. You're here and you think, I'm a pretty good person. I do the right things. I, I, I mean, I may sin a little, but I do a lot more good than I do bad. I've come to this church since I was born. None of those things can save you. And so today, you are here like the paralyzed man, needing the forgiveness only found in Jesus. Can I just tell you, right now, you are laying on the mat on the floor, and if you will confess to Jesus your sins, believe that God sent Jesus to die in your place for your sins, and then raised him from the dead, you can be saved. The Bible says, with the heart, man believes under righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. If you can do those things, if you will do those things and submit your life to God, then you can be a Christian. You can be forgiven. God will heal you. Maybe not in every physical way, but he will will heal you spiritually and he will take you to heaven where you will find ultimate healing. If you're here today and that's you right now with no one else, just, just right now in this place, would you say, God, I know I've sinned. I want forgiveness. I put my faith in Jesus who died for me and rose from the grave. And I commit my life to you, God. Please forgive me. The Bible says, if you do, he is faithful and just to forgive you of all your unrighteousness. So there are the people who need salvation. And then there are people who need to get their one to Jesus. There are people who have been apathetic, who have just kind of let life pass them by, created reasons, allowed reasons and excuses to get in the way of sharing the gospel with people who desperately need Jesus. So I'm going to ask you, if you're in that second group, you're a Christian, but you have at, you are ready to take a step. You, you know that you need to do more. If that's you right now, I'm going to ask you to do something. In your pew, there are some cards. There are some cards that look like this. You should see one in your pew. Look around, look around. You don't have, I realize I'm pretty and it's hard not to look at me, but you can look around and find the, find the card. Okay, take the card. Take the card, and if you flip it over to the white side, there's a section right here that says, who's your one? It's the small section. It says, who's your one? You see it? Okay, here's what I want you to do today. If you know who your one is, I want you to write their name in, just like I wrote my name in right here. And as we have this time of commitment, I'd love it if you would tear that part off and just come and place it right here on the stairs. What we're going to do is after the service, we're going to gather all those up. You might say, Chris, I don't want, I'm not comfortable getting around all those people right now. Okay, fill it out. And when you leave today, if you'll put them in the offering boxes. But we as a staff are going to gather all these up and we are going to pray for your one. And so symbolically, when you do this, you are committing to God. God, I have identified my one. I will do whatever it takes to get this person to Jesus and then I will leave the rest up to him. That's the commitment you're making when you do this. I sure hope that we're not a church full of people who stand at the door with our paralyzed friend and decide, you know what, nah, it's too hard. I'm just going to go home. Sorry, buddy. Wish it could have worked out. Wish you could have made it happen. But, oh well, maybe next time. I pray that we would be committed followers of Jesus who are seeking to bring our one to Jesus.